I'm going to call the July 15, 2014 meeting of the Moorhead Public Service Commission to order. Could I have a motion, please, concerning the agenda? I so move. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Could I have a similar motion with regard to the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Bill, any customers to be heard or recognitions? We have one recognition. Really? Yes. Okay. And if uh, Commissioner Stephenson would come down to the podium, uh, Mr. Heller, Mr. Tom Heller from uh, Missouri River Energy Services is going to make a, a stranger from the south. Stranger from the south. <laughs> and Tom, maybe if you'd introduce yourself, that would be helpful first. Uh, members of the commission, my name is Tom Heller. I'm the CEO of Missouri River Energy Services in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, your power supplier. And former general manager of Moorhead Public Service Commission, I might add. And it is great to be back in Moorhead. And it's nice to have you here. Well, thank you very much. We have a very special award to be presented today. It's the Maurice Topaski Public Officials Award, which was named after the inv individual who sometimes has been referred to as the founder, the founding father of Missouri River Energy Services. His vision was communities working together for a sound economical joint power supply program. In addition to serving on the board of directors for this organization in those formative years, he also served as mayor of Sioux Center, Iowa for 34 years. The Topaski Public Officials Award was established in the year 2000 to honor public officials who have given years of distinguished leadership and dedicated service to their community, municipal utilities, and in support of public power beyond their communities as well. Our recipient this year is Corrine Stephenson. Corrine has served in the Public Service Commission, as you know, for nine years, serving on both the Finance and Human Resource Committees, and last year she became a member of the American Public Power Association's Policy Makers Council. In addition, she's a regular participant in both annual meetings and legislative activities of APPA, of Minnesota Municipal Utilities Association, often serving as a spokesman. She has a long history of working in leadership roles with organizations that encompass a wide range of interests and purposes. These include economic development, social services, business, banking, education, cultural, and more. The list of her accomplishments is long and impressive. Her work in community service both in and outside of Moorhead have been for the betterment of many organizations and group groups along with countless individuals. Kareen, on behalf of Missouri River Energy Services, I'm pleased to present this award to you. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Heller, for this wonderful award, and I hope you will extend it to the Missouri River Board. And I have one last comment. I hope all of us, which I do, appreciate all the work you do in Washington for all the policies that are extremely important for more public service. Thank, thank you. you very much. Oh, I get a picture with yeah, Tom. Yeah. It's our first Tom. Trouble your warrant. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> If I might add a couple of words, Tom, to what you said, we have been so lucky to have Corrine serving on the board with us here at Moore Public Service. I've known Corrine for more years than even I want to admit, and um, she has always worked tirelessly for everything that Moorhead Public Service stands for, and I'm proud to call her a friend, and I'm glad she's been with us for the nine years that we've been able to keep her. And I, I know that if she's been working with you at both through APPA and Missouri mm -hmm. River that she did a great job no matter what it is she did. Thank you. And Tom, I, I echo also what Corrine said a few moments ago, because when I first started here uh, a long time ago as a commissioner, you were very active at that time with APPA and all of the things that benefit people with municipal utilities. And I too want to thank you for all the hard work you've done both in Washington and regionally. Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add? Not for recognitions. Okay. Any old business? No. Well, if I could call Travis down here. <laughs> it's now the 15th of July. <laughs> and I wouldn't have noticed that the windmill wasn't turning, except for the fact that because they're redoing 11th Street, I now have to go over on 75, which they're also redoing. So go figure that one. <laughs> So tell me, what is the latest on our windmill? 
Um, we have uh, been delayed a little bit on the uh, repair of the wind turbine. Uh, this was due to a, uh, a cost that uh, the wind turbine company wanted us to incur for the crane service to fix the, the turbine. Uh, we had to send a couple responses back to um, inform them that it was in the specifications that it was their cost and they've agreed to that and they are working to get a crane going. So it'll be just, it was delayed a little bit longer. What is the next date you'll give us? Um, I actually requested a date yesterday. Uh, I have not heard a response back yet. Okay. Why don't you make it very clear to them that we expect them to live up the terms and conditions of the contract yep. that we have with them? Yep, they agreed to that. They were very, um, they were very, um, I guess, in, agree in agreement that they were going to hold up their end of the bargain. So well, did they, they expect that this thing was just going to fall into place, or did they not need a crane to? Well, I guess not. Okay. So Thank you, much, Travis. How much money are we uh, losing a month, a week, a day, whatever it is, by not having the thing spin? Actually, we... Uh, and Travis can back me up on this. We talked about it at our staff meeting this morning. Um, June was a real, um, you know, a little, real quiet month, real <coughs> cool month, unfortunately, for us up here in the north uh, Minnesota. Um, so actually, we didn't uh, set a new peak or anything. So we uh, were fortunate in, in June. It would be very nice if by the end of July we had this operational so that during the hot days in July we were able to use it for peak uh, you know, it would just be on during our peaking season. So, um, and I don't know, I don't really have a cost, but. Yeah, basically the, you know, depending on how how hard the wind is blowing will depend on how much KW that thing is putting out per hour. Um, that would reduce our, our purchase power cost by 2250 an hour, I think, is what it would be per KW. So, depending on how fast that turbine is, is turning is, is what would we would in, we would save basically in purchase power costs. So. Well, it's obviously a very visible sign of what we yep. do in Moorhead, so we do want it back up and operating. Oh, I agree with you. I've been trying. And, and you got that subtle message from Bill, right? It would be really nice to have it running by the end of July. I, I was told that this morning as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Travis. Thank you. Members of the City Council, Chuck, what do you have to report to us? Uh, not too much. We're looking at the budget process right now, and. Um, you know, just beginning that process and as a newbie I'm learning as we go so and uh, tonight I have to ditch a little bit early at um, five o'clock because we have a joint meeting with the Clay County Commissioners so. yes I read in the paper that might be an interesting meeting yes <laughs> that's it thank Thanks. you members of the Public Service Commission uh, maybe that's a quick uh, reminder we have our next meeting with the S budget group tomorrow morning so we hope to make additional progress. So, so far, so good. Good. I hope that's true, uh, progress-wise. I'd like to report also that uh, Rolf and I and Bill met with representatives of the Red River Valley Co-op uh, yesterday and uh, began discussions with them on the possibility of uh, working things out in advance of the takeover of uh, our service territory in Oakport Township. and. Those conversations will continue, and we invited them to additional meetings, maybe on a monthly basis, if uh, we can possibly do that. Yep. Anything you want to add to that, Bill? <clears throat> Just that uh, we're hoping we have the next meeting in sometime in August, probably late August. I already sent Lauren an email, so we're trying to arrange a, a date. Okay. And maybe a clarification, too, that there's, a, there's no likelihood at all that we would do anything by January 1st of 2015. Yeah, that's a very so. good point, because... You know, even if today we had settlement on uh, all the issues that we would negotiate, we still wouldn't be able to do any construction this year. So, I mean, the, the earliest would be next summer, and that's unlikely that uh, we would get something even by this winter so that we do construction next summer. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done. So I'm thinking, you know, two summers from now is probably when people would see new service from more public service. And we also are dealing with two different entities. We're dealing with Red River and we're dealing with Excel on top of it yep. because there's two providers up there. So it'll take a while. Uh, it won't affect the annexation, I think, from a city side, uh, but from our side, we, we will take more time. Right, and I, I have been in contact with Excel Energy as well. And so they will be contacting me again with, it's likely that we'll be talking with people out of Minneapolis on this issue. Uh, they deal with that. Okay. Service territory issue in Minnesota. Very good. Anybody else? Okay, that brings us down to item 8D. 
which is to accept the report on MRES's update and well, the. How about my report? Did I skip you? <laughs> you know, and I, it was so easy the way I did that. <laughs> and Mr. General Manager, do you have some things to report? Well, I just wanted to highlight what's in the. Uh, exactly. Yeah, no. What's in the report. And uh, there's a number of uh, items that are related to 8D, the MRES uh, issues that uh, Tom is going to talk about. I just sent some of them ahead, some of them to you ahead of time. Uh, there's issues about the bond rating of the successful bond rating that uh, Missouri River Energy Services just did, uh, the uh, uh, bond rating agency's rating of Missouri River's bonds is also in there, or Western Minnesota's bonds. Um, number Item number one, so there's a number of things about MRES, and you can talk to Tom actually about some of those. Um, item number one though, and, and it's unfortunate that Commissioner Anderson is not here at this time, but he's sitting on a, on a working group on water issues that's very interesting. And item number one has an article about that. So maybe I'll put that on the general manager's report for the next meeting as well. And then Dave Anderson can explain that, uh, what he's working on. But he's very much involved in the water issues uh, as long as, or as well as uh, Commissioner uh, Ralph is as well. So anyway, with that, if there's no questions, I'll just uh, yield to item eight. So, so I could have. So, you're telling me that Mr. Baki was correct, but you really had nothing to say, <laughs> right? Maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, brings it on to 8D. Mr. Heller is going to report on the MRES update in the 2013 annual report. Tom, we're going to turn it over to you. And Thank I, you. I do want to say one thing before that. Sorry. Uh, the next three items, well, the next four items actually are kind of a continuation of our strategic planning uh, discussions and Tom was uh, willing to come up and and speak on power supply and transmission type issues. The other two issues that follow that, one is the report um, on the reliability loop feeding issue that we had from a couple of months ago, a uh, preliminary report. Uh, another one is on undergrounding of our overhead system in town. So I'm just giving you a little bit of an intro. Well, and the, the last one um, is going to be uh, talking a little bit about the aquifer management plan. So again, during the summer, we try and do some strategic planning type issues. So I want, I want you to kind of think about the strategic directions that you want us to go in. And when you listen to Tom present, power supply is probably 60 to 70% of our costs on the electric side. And so some of the things that Tom deals with are the big issues uh, in the future. And he would be interested in your direction as well. Um, we did meet with the mayor just before this meeting. And it's interesting because, uh, you know, some of the things that Tom's going to talk about on the Red Rock hydroelectric project is there is an environmentally sensitive component to it. And she was very sensitive to that. Uh, so, I mean, we need to hear you know, from you as well, that those are the right directions that we're going to, that we're going to head. So with that introduction, uh, you know, uh, Tom Heller is here and uh, thank him for coming. Well, thank you, Bill. And thank you, Ken and members of the commission. Appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you uh, this afternoon and to come up and present the award to Corrine. Uh, I'd like to provide a little background on what we're doing at Missouri River Energy Services. I'll, I'll first start with just generally, really quickly, who we are, what we do, uh, so that everyone uh, knows and has an, has an understanding of that. I'll talk a little bit about our power supply resources we have now and some interesting uh, developments that we have in a new project, Red Rock Hydro Project, a new hydro project that we are building in Iowa. And I'd like to then follow up uh, uh, talking about, as Bill mentioned, the, the financing that we've just done for that project and a little discussion on rates, rates that we're looking at in the future. First, though, Missouri River Energy Services. We are a joint action agency. Uh, 61 municipal t utilities, uh, just like Moorhead, have joined together to form Missouri River Energy Services. Our offices are in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And on the map, you can see the cities are located where those dots are. North Dakota, Minnesota, South Dakota, and Iowa. Uh, half the sales, though, are in the state of Minnesota. Uh, also on the map, along with the cities that are shown there, you can see the, the power supply resources that, that are used to serve you. 
uh, on the blue lines on the Missouri River are the, the resources from Western Area Power Administration, which you get about half of your, your power from, from WAPA. Uh, those are those resources. In addition to that, you can also see on the map the uh, generating resources of Missouri River Energy Services. We have Laramie River Station in Wyoming. That's why the map is as extended as large as it is. That's our largest resource, independent resource. We have our gas turbines in Watertown, South Dakota, Exira, uh, Iowa, and uh, some wind turbine projects as well. And also Wisconsin is there because we do have a component of a nuclear power that we are, we are purchasing as well. But that's a picture of who we are. Uh, Municipal Joint Action Agency, uh, Missouri River Energy Services, Bill sits on the Board of Directors. The 61 members elect 14 members to serve on the Board of Directors, and Bill is, is the senior member now from, from uh, Minnesota that serves on the Board. There are two agencies, and on the slide you can see down on the bottom there, Missouri River Energy Services and Western Minnesota Municipal Power Agency. Missouri River is nothing more than a joint powers agreement between, between cities and four states. And as such, we have no financing authority. So Western Minnesota was formed by the, by the state laws of Iowa. They're an agency composed, comprised of uh, Minnesota members, Minnesota cities, that do the financing for Missouri River Energy Services. They own all the facilities, and all of the output of those facilities is dedicated to Missouri River, and then it's sold to all of the members, just like Moorhead. Uh, we're very proud to have Moorhead as a member. You're the set, you purchased uh, about the second most power uh, of, of any other, of any uh, member community. So uh, we're very pleased that you are, you are one of our members. Picture of our power supply. What does it look like right now? The year 2014. Well, our average member, and you're pretty close to our average member, you get a little bit more than 40%, but the hydro is about 40% of our average member's power supply portfolio. Coal from specifically Laramie River Station provides about another 40%. We have the nuclear power I mentioned from the Point Beach Power Plant in, 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 in Wisconsin that we have a contract with for 20 years. And our wind resources are 6%. Now the state of Minnesota requires that we have uh, the, the uh, portfolio standard that we must meet by the year 2025, but we don't have to count the hydro uh, in, in, in basically the uh, in, in to be divided by that. So it's just the percentage on the coal and other resources. So uh, from a Minnesota perspective, we're about 11 or 12 percent, 11 or 12 percent wind. But when you look at that picture, you can see WAPA, wind, and nuclear, we're an average more than 50 percent non-carbon resources, which we're very proud of, that we have a, a low carbon footprint. One of the resources that I do need to uh, report on with you is the, the one that, the first resource that we really had to provide power for you, and that's Laramie River Station, a coal-powered resource in Wheatland, Wyoming. We are one of six members or six owners of this, of this uh, uh, resource. Basin Electric in Bismarck is the, is the operator and the largest owner. Tri-State Power in Colorado is, is an owner. Western Minnesota, uh, us, we are another member. Lincoln Electric in Lincoln, Nebraska. Wyoming Municipal Power Agency and Heartland Consumer Power District. Missouri River owns of those three units about 16.5% or about 280 megawatts out of the 1,550 megawatts that's there. This has been a very good resource for us. It's been very economical. It's been one of the reasons why we've been able to keep your rates low through today. That, that plant has been in production since 1980. However, there's some issues there and some issues that we're working on very hard to make sure that it, it, they don't impact your rates more than they need to. And those issues deal with several things, some of the operational things like water. We've had water problems there with droughts. Right now, though, we're back up to normal with the, uh, with the good spring runoff. There's been years where we've had to buy water from the ranchers with pipes across the ground to supplement water resources at the, at the plant. But we have plans in place to, to make sure that that risk is mitigated. Coal issues, we've had problems with Burlington Northern Santa Fe and deliveries of coal. We are on a tariff right now with BNSF, a 20 year tariff that's halfways over. We're 10 years into a tariffed rate and we're still in court fighting over what that rate should be. Hopefully someday that'll get, that'll get settled, but uh, it's an issue that we're working on. Uh, the ones that are probably more, more of a concern are with the Environmental Protection Agency though, and there's two that I wanna make you aware of today that are going to cost us some money and they're going to cost us some money and have an impact on your rates in the future. The first is a regional haze issue. A regional haze is not an environmental issue. 
It's not, I should say, it's not a, a, a human health issue. It doesn't have anything to do with health. It has to do with the visibility of the air. And specifically, the uh, Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota, the EPA has run models and have shown that the visibility in the Wind Cave National Park in South Dakota is, got, is, has limited visibility due to the models that are run from the, from the uh, uh, emissions of, of nitrogen, ox nitrogen oxides from the Laramie River Station. We have installed low NOx burners over fire air and have agreed with the state of Wyoming that we would even put in what's called selective non-catalytic reduction at an additional $60 million. EPA said that's not good enough. We want you to put in selective catalytic reduction on those three plants at a cost of $750 million. And for us, that's $125 million. For you, that's probably about another 7% rate increase. So we're working very hard to try to get the government or to get the, through the courts, to try to get the uh, EPA to stay that order so that we have a little more time to work with the EPA to determine if there's a more acceptable solution rather than having to install those SCRs. Now, if it was just that, it wouldn't be a problem. We'd put them in and yeah, it's a little bit of an increase, but if we knew we could run that plant for 20 years, 30 years, you'd still get great value out of it. There's another environmental regulation though that's causing us some concern and that's the recently reduced, released rules on carbon emissions for existing power plants. Now that rule may have some pretty dramatic impacts on Laramie River Station. They're directed at the state of Wyoming and the state of Wyoming now has to provide comments. The rules will be final from the EPA next summer and then the state will have to come up with some regulations on how to, on how to implement those rules. It could mean that we may not be able to burn as much coal. It could mean that we may have to build more renewable resources. And in fact, the Red Rock Hydro Project may work real well with this to get some credits for emissions. Uh, but there's some, there's, some, uh, there's some risks that are looming out there that the ability for us to get the full utilization out of that plant in the future may be limited. I just wanted you to be aware uh, of those risks that we see in the future. I guess I should have said on the onset that if there are any questions while I'm going through this, please interrupt me. But I wanted to spend a few minutes on something that we're very excited about and I think will fit very well into the future of our organization. And that's a new project, the Red Rock Hydro Project. I put a brochure. I think you should have one of those on your, on your, on your, uh, uh, in front of you that talks about this. There are, uh, the Department of Energy says uh, in, an, in a study that they've completed, they believe that there's about 80,000 megawatts of capacity that can be built on existing dams in the United States. That's a tremendous amount of renewable energy that can get built. This is one of those projects. This project is an existing dam that was built on the Des Moines River just downstream from, uh, 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 from the city of Des Moines. Um, called the, it's called the Red Rock Lake and Red Rock Dam. It was built in 1969, and there was never any electric generation put on it. Uh, there was a study permit that you have to get from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. We purchased that several years ago from a developer and have went through the process of purchasing turbines, hiring a con consultant, and recently we have just uh, signed a contract with a construction company, Ames Construction out of Minneapolis, to build this resource for us. This fall we're going to start construction. Groundbreaking is in August and uh, by the year 2018 it's going to take three years to build because we've got to, we've got to cut two or three, three 20 foot holes uh, through the concrete walls of the uh, dam. So it's going to take a little while to construct but we're, we're quite, quite uh, uh, excited about getting this, this resource online. A couple of other views of the, of the resource itself. This is a, an overhead view of the dam itself. There, is there a pointer on this thing? No, it won't work. Okay. The project location, this is an overhead view. You can see where the, where the, uh, uh, the star there is where the generation is gonna take place. The, the, uh, the dam itself, the water behind the dam is to the left would go through the turbines rather than going through the gates that are exist now and producing no electricity. The Corps of Engineers would, would, uh, uh, would allow the water to run through the, the turbines which are going to be right at the star there. And there's a couple of uh, engineering diagrams here as well that show, that show a little bit of, of how the approach 
uh, what the intake, this is the intake uh, looking downstream. This is the, the, the intake structure is there um, and the existing spillway you can see. And this, this side here is, shows the powerhouse. This is where the river is. This is looking upstream. You can see where the existing, where the existing dam is and the existing gates and where the new powerhouse is going to be and the turbines and where the water of the tail race comes out of. This project is about 55 megawatts, uh, so it's only going to be 5% of our power supply. It's not going to be a huge portfolio of our members' power supply. Uh, and it's expensive, a lot more expensive than we thought it was going to be when we started designing it. Uh, one of the main reasons the costs have gone up is the Corps of Engineers has required a lot of safety provisions to be put in there that weren't anticipated by the design engineers. And the Corps has even admitted that some of them are questionable whether they're needed, but we're going to have to do them anyway because that's, they're the ones that hold the rules. Probably in the order of $50 million is what they've increased the cost. This project is going to cost us $379 million is what we have in the budget. Uh, the the uh, uh, project will be 55 megawatts. Uh, it's going to cost a lot of money, but when you consider the fact that this, this renewable energy project will produce energy during the summer months, during peak, it's very valuable. We have to build renewable energy. One of the problems with renewable energy that we have, that we already have, wind, is that during the peak periods, the wind doesn't blow. So we have to have other resources to back that up. So you've got wind and you've got gas turbines to back it up. With this resource, the Corps of Engineers fills up the reservoir in the winter, in the, in the spring, and they release the water during the summer months, which is exactly when we need it. So during the peak periods, this thing produces energy. It's not like a wind resource that'll be, that'll die off. That's why this is so valuable to us. Question for Tom, or just a clear, not a, not a question per se, just a statement. Uh, Moorhead is about 10% of MRES as far as energy purchases. So when you look at $380 million, I mean, our take on that or our responsibility is roughly 38 million. So it's a, it's a significant investment for uh, Moorhead and for the citizens of Moorhead. The other thing before, and I know Tom's going on to transmission issues Let's now, but up. a question on you know power supply or you know a strategic direction type of uh, question is, is is the commission comfortable that? I mean, you saw the pie chart. We've got a certain amount of coal. We've got a certain amount of wind. We got some nuclear. We've got some market purchases there. Um, you know, we're now going to have another 5% pie, similar to the nuclear one, that's going to be, you know, hydro. And it is a little, it's more costly than coal, but it does meet some, you know, requirements in the state of Minnesota. Um, you know, from a direction standpoint, that, that seemed to be a good direction that the board discussed quite a bit at MRES. Um, and I would just you know, guess that you would concur. Um, it's a little more environmentally responsible. It's much more environmentally responsible than coal. Uh, nobody's building new coal plants, although we tried a few years ago to build uh, Big Stone too. You know, our pie chart would be a lot different because we wouldn't be doing Red Rock. We would have had more coal. So it's just an interesting, in the turn of five years, an interesting uh, different strategic direction if we're talking strategic directions, not having as much coal and having less or having more hydro. So anyway, just some thoughts. Being some back to this, and I'll just take a second on this chart again. One thing you don't see there is natural gas. We have got natural gas peaking turbines, but we don't generate much with those. They're, they're, they're basically on standby uh, and are used when, when you, you know, just a couple of times a year when the prices get just outrageous in the market. We buy in the market. Those market purchases are much cheaper. Uh, we looked at putting a natural gas combined cycle unit in. We're not excited about it. We don't, we are not as trusting as the rating agencies and others have been with a long-term price forecasts of gas. We think natural gas prices are going to go up. We think they're going to go up a lot sooner than most people think they are. And we would rather have a more diversified portfolio uh, and maybe a little gas in the future, but not putting all our eggs in one basket again like we did with coal in the past. 
I was in uh, Williston a couple of days last week, and uh, there's a lot of gas being flared off right now. Is there any plans that you know of for anybody to build a gas plant up there? With well, the uh, base and electric has got, I think, two that they're building up there, gas turbines, but they're they're going to be connected, uh, obviously, to the existing pipelines and, mm -hmm. and, and gas systems. But uh, Basin has a massive need for new, new or more energy up in, in the Bakken region. Mm -hmm. I think they're looking for 1,500 megawatts, in fact. I'd like to talk about financing, but before I do, yes, I'm sorry. Well, and one of the, the, pro the things that's happening with the Environmental Protection Agency and their new CO2 regulations is that I don't, I think, and I think many others do too, that, that the EPA wants to shut down a lot of the old coal plants and even some of the newer ones. Coal just not being used. That's mostly going to get replaced with natural gas. And if the electric utilities have to start burning that gas instead of coal, uh, it's a tremendous increase in demand. Uh, that plus the exports that we're looking at for uh, uh, liquefied natural gas going to uh, other countries, I, th I think the prices are going to go up. The EPA board is really stressing with this and all the messages I'm getting and what they want us to do is basically concerned about the EPA and what they're going to demand. So they're kind of asking us to contact as many as we can to get a feel before we get there so we're prepared for the questions of how they feel about this. Hmm. So it seems to be the stress of our meeting in Washington. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's our number one issue is what the EPA is doing to us. So at one point, uh, Bill, to your question on whether we're okay with it, I mean, we are, we are one of 61 members of MRES, and I mean, what MRES decides, unless we are no longer a member, we obviously will go with that. I mean, well, and you get, I mean, I'm on the board of MRES, so I mean, that's where you've got your input, and then talking to Tom about that as well. And, and I don't expect you to answer the question like right now, but I mean, if you do ever have concerns or you hear from citizens of Moorhead that, you know, they have uh, opinions about our power supply, certainly get those to me and I'll get those to Tom and we can do that. Because, you know, like our meeting with the mayor, we presented the same, same uh, these issues. And I mean, she was generally uh, excited about the Red Rock project and kind of the direction that we were going. So, um, you know, if you talk to anyone, you certainly can bring that up to us. And I mean, and, and Dennis has a plan with the solar garden as well. I mean, that's another little step, you know, going yep. the right direction. Travis, at some point, will have the second turbine running again. <laughs> you will, I heard, yeah. You know, and maybe at some point when the time is right, we'll need to talk about turbine three and four and five. I mean, who right. knows, right? That could be right. another way to look at it. Well, and, and that's another, I mean, you know, Tom could talk a little bit about wind versus solar versus hydro, you know, because I think, you know, the, uh, as far as a, from a, standpoint of what people are putting out there for to meet the Minnesota requirement of 25% of your portfolio has to be renewable by 2025. Most of it is wind right now. We're actually probably a little bit on the forefront of the next wave, which is hydro. And like Tom mentioned, that hydro is going to last for 80 years, where a wind turbine typically lasts, lasts 20. And you do have problems with them like we're having with ours. So the, the hydro project is a pretty solid, reliable project, but it is expensive. And uh, it's a lot more than coal is, it's a lot more than natural gas is, and it's, it's not, and solar is, is expensive as well. That's why most people right now are putting in wind, so. So how much time will we have to pay off the $38 million uh, on Red River, at Red Rock? Actually, next week we're going to be closing on the bond sale for, for this, and, and let me talk, if I may, uh, just, just talk about that, and then I'll get into the bonds themselves. We've got, uh, we were, felt quite fortunate, and Bill is chairman of Western Minnesota Municipal Power Agency, as I mentioned, the financing agent for uh, Missouri River. And we were able to retain our AA bond ratings, which uh, were only one of two system joint action agencies in the United States that has that good of a bond rating. Um, double A minus from Fitch and A, big A, little A, three from Moody's. Uh, we we're quite 
happy with that. And we were, what we were able to do is on an average, the bonds uh, average life of 21 years, 4.05%. Uh, when we went out for subscriptions on the bonds, we had uh, 10 times as many orders as we had bonds to sell. So we are able to keep cutting the rates until we were able to, uh, uh, companies started backing away. So uh, we hit the market at a very good time and we got a very, very good rate. Uh, they're 30 year bonds, they'll be paid off in 30 years. So and actually after 30 years, there's really no operational costs with a hydro unit. You're gonna have a little bit of O&M and you'll have some refurbishments that you're gonna be needing to do. Uh, but once the debt is paid off, just like the Whopper resources, you know, when Moore had made the decision years and years ago to go with, with uh, the Bureau of Reclamation and shut your local coal plant down, Whopper rates were, the, the rates for hydro were high. Now they're very, very competitive. That's what this unit is going to provide, this, this generating station is going to provide for Missouri River and its members in 15 to 20 years. It's probably going to be our cheapest resource. The bond issue that we sold wasn't only for, um, was not only for uh, the Red Rock Hydro project. Just a minute and, and uh, I'll, I'll take on talking about other things we need money for. One of the things that we are investors in are the CapEx 2020 projects. We are 10% owners of the Fargo line, the line from Fargo to Monticello, 5% uh, owners of the Brookings to, to Minneapolis line. So we are a partner with XL. Uh, and Great River Energy and the other utilities in Minnesota for those lines. Our investment in those two lines will be about $120 million. So rather than paying rent to utilities for us to use their lines, we have ownership rights and we own those lines and we are get able to get a rate of return from the Midwest ISO from those as well. So it's a very, it's a very, uh, uh, a very lucrative uh, undertaking for us and you, you as, as our members. This map also shows the, the blue dots are in what's called the Midwest ISO footprint, and the brown dots are the ones, and including Moorhead there at the, kind of the end of the Fargo line, uh, that, that are not in MISO that will soon be in what's called the Southwest Power Pool, SPP. And in October of 2015, Western Area Power Administration will be going into that. So we will operate in two different, two different markets. Uh, there's some, some problems with that, but we're, we're, we're kind of operating that way now with operating in, in a non-existent market and, a, and MISO. Uh, but because of that, there could be some increases in WAPA costs, and we're still trying to, uh, in their transmission delivery rates, not their power supply rates, but their transmission delivery rates, and we're, we're, trying to, we're working through that with WAPA right now on what those costs may be. On, on that note, little side, do we have that new agreement yet from WAPA? Uh, the agreement, I did talk with WAPA. It looks like it will be 2015 before we before they start on it. Uh, we've got some interconnections, a uh, couple of them here in town that complicate the contract a bit, and they're still working through all the other contracts. We have one of the more complex ones, and they're leaving those to the end. They do want to complete all the contracts by 2016, and uh, so I'm thinking we'll probably see it sometime in 15. Thanks. Yep. Last slide, and the last thing I want to talk about is rates. Where are rates going? And I, uh, the, the, the last slide, slide shows, it doesn't show the, the identity of area wholesale power suppliers, but it, it numbers them. And in this, you can see that our supplemental rates, the rates we charge to you is the red bar, 5.8 cents. That's what it is in 2014. The average of all the utilities, of the other utilities, Hache, in the region is 6.6 .6 cents for wholesale rates. The average of your costs and our members' costs, though, is down very low, 5.1 cents. And that's the reason for that is because you're half hydropower from WAPA. Some of the other supplemental suppliers up there have WAPA power blended in as well. Uh, there's some of the rural electrics that, that have half hydropower and, and half, half power from basin electrics, so that kind of gives you an idea. Uh, and other ones are joint action agencies that don't have any hydropower over to the right. We are looking at rate increases because of Red Rock of two mills, Next year, in 2015, two and two sixteen, and two and two seventeen. Uh, five of those six being for Red Rock, one being for probably the transmission project. You add six mills to that, we're about 6.4. If everybody else's rates stayed the same, our rates would be about 6.4, 6.5 cent range. Uh, if we have to do the SCRs, we're going to have to add a couple of mills on top of that as well. So we'd probably be a little bit on the other side of that, uh, but. 
you've got to believe, and I know for a fact that other utilities are having the same issues we're having with power supply and having issues at their coal generating stations and having to make improvements to, to, to facilitate uh, CO2 regulations as well, as well as regional haze regulations. So I'm, believe, I'm going to have to believe that we're going to be staying in the, you know, in the lower half of those, though, that, that curve uh, in the very near future. Bill, I don't know, as chairman of finance committee of Missouri River, Bill has a lot to say about where our rates go as well. Well, you want to put me on the spot? <laughs> sure, no. No, I we, don't. We, we, do, we do have good rates, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, just like more Public Service Commission goes through their budget process and their rate-setting process, uh, the Finance Committee of Missouri River Energy Services uh, in the fall goes through all of their costs, line item by line item, and, uh, and then looks at the budget and, and sets its rates. Most, most recently, they did go to a seasonal rate when Travis was, uh, was up here talking about the wind turbines and how we want to get our, uh, and he talked about a $22 per kW uh, rate. That's the summer rate, and that's the highest rate that we pay. It used to be that we had a flat rate all year. Now it's higher during the three months of the summer, the three months in the winter, and then it's uh, a lot less in the three months in the fall and the spring. And that's just reflecting where costs are going and so the finance committee looks at those and then of course we have to pass those on to our customers as well so we have seasonal rates too so Les you had a question I don't have a question I have a comment would you back up about three slides and where the capex line is that yeah, one right, that one. right yeah. there uh, and I, I'll lead it in and you can answer things if there are people out in the audience that want to see actually what that is, all I gotta do is drive down uh, I-94 to the Twin Cities or go about eight, 10 miles south on I-29 and they'll see that line crossing the river. It's those huge poles along the way that are, are helping supply the Twin Cities area with electricity, is that correct? Well, that was the original purpose. That was the original The plan. original purpose of the, the CapEx lines were, it was CapEx 2020, and there was four lines that were to be built because of the needs of, the, of Minnesota and the region in the year 2020. And two of the lines are the Brookings line, the Fargo line. There's another small one not long down by La Crosse, Wisconsin, and a small piece up, uh, up by Bemidji, a smaller 230 line. These are 340 KV, 345 KV lines. Uh, that were the main purpose, especially the Brookings line, is to allow import of, of wind energy to the to into Minnesota, to get renewable energy into the state. However, since those lines have started to be built, and I think they'll all be in in, in operation probably next year. They're under that construction was my now. That's my next question: whether they'll and, be operating. And actually, the Alexandria substation is owned by Western Minnesota. Uh, those lines will be in production next year. However, a lot of the power that originally flowed from North Dakota to Minnesota doesn't go that direction anymore. Uh, with the Bakken uh, oil needs, the, uh, uh, there, there is not a huge North Dakota export anymore. A lot of that power is staying right there. So these lines will be much more neat, will be, have a greater use for renewable energy to get in, in, into Minnesota. Explain that, Tom. Well. There's coal, there's coal plants originally were built in North Dakota to send power to the Twin Cities and to Minnesota. There is such a demand for energy right now for the oil pumping and drilling that a lot of the power in central North Dakota that's being generated at the coal plants, it's staying there. Okay. It's not flowing to Minneapolis anymore. So what, do we, what are we going to use the line for? Oh, renewable energy. From North Dakota into? Yeah. I think that's one of the, that'll be one of the big purposes of the lines. Well, not and only it's also re for reliability purposes too. I mean, we, th when these lines, when they were designed and looked at, they were looked at as, you know, how can we build a system to reliably keep it strong so that if you have a, uh, a catast catastrophe someplace, you know, what, what's going to be needed to keep the system, system online, and uh, especially the Fargo line is needed for that. And yet the, uh, the southern line does pick up a lot of wind yeah. out of uh, southwestern Minnesota, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Wind power, wind generated electricity mm -hmm. doesn't pick up wind. <laughs> too small a line. Correct me. Too small a line. I know that was very brief, but it was kind of a snapshot of some of the things that we're working on right now. And I 
really like to thank you for being a member of Missouri River and, and, and allowing Bill to, to come down to Sioux Falls and, and be on the board of directors of both Missouri River and Western Minnesota. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. As thank always, you. it's nice to see you. You can turn. Quaker. Can I have a motion to accept Tom's report? I so move. Second. All those in favor, sig signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign. That motion carries. That brings us down to item 8E, which is to accept the report on the radio feed redundancy. Is Travis coming down to speak to that? Travis is going to come down to speak to that. Um, let's see here. There's an item in your agenda, and, and uh, in that item, we did have the uh, uh, minutes from the uh, from that meeting. No, maybe we didn't. I'm looking at the wrong report. No, anyway, this was in response to a couple of months ago where we had our uh, where we had that outage that took quite a long time. I mean, probably three hours to repair, and uh, the repair on a radio line means a longer outage. So we talked about, you know, what's the plan or, uh, you know, what would be the plan to uh, improve on that. And so Travis has done some preliminary work. And uh, so this is a preliminary report on some of that work and then we're gonna continue that work. So Travis. Travis Schmidt, electrical engineering manager. Uh, like Bill talked about, you guys requested, you know, what's gonna be the plan. Um, to provide equitable service to all the customers in both overhead and underground areas that have radio feeds providing them power. Uh, right now we have about 192 feeds in town, um, both in overhead and underground areas. So it's, it's not just overhead areas. Um, a lot of overhead areas do have most of your radios just because it's, um, it's a lot harder to back feed um, overhead lines than it is underground lines. Um, with that being said, we've got, um, we kind of looked at it and put a plan in place that it would take between 10 to 20 years to, you know, radially, or excuse me, loop feed all these radials. Um, right now we've got about three of our primary feeders, the lines from our substations that are um, radials. Two of those being radials are because they're on the edge of town. Well, technically all three are on the edge of town right now. Um, two of them are underground, one of them is overhead. Uh, we have. 42 three-phase tap lines. So basically these are lines from the feeders into the residential or commercial areas. And then we've got about 147 uh, single-phase lines that go from the three-phase tap lines or feeders off into the distribution and residential areas. Um, you know, some of the concerns are, you know, of putting a redundancy plan together on radio feeds, and a lot of it probably more overhead than underground, is um, they may not be cost-effective. Um, you may not be able to provide redundancy to these customers just due to the area that that radial feed is in. Um, some of the other costs, you're going to have added tree trimming costs to this. And you'll also have, um, it will affect your outage time as well, but it probably won't affect it as much as um, just converting something to underground will. Um, looking at this, some of these projects can cost between $5,000 and $500,000. Um, just depending on how, how you would relocate everything. Um, right now we're kind of looking at it um, and it's going to look like it's going to cost about $9 million um, and it, over a 15 year plan if this is something you guys would want to, to do in a strategic direction. So um, with that, I'll, any questions? I missed, Les? I mean, oh, sorry. <clears throat> Les? Uh, what is, what is the average number of minutes that a customer is without power from us in an annual basis? We have uh, standards of 60 minutes or less. Um, there's a few different um, indices that we use, but we would like to have customers not have an outage that lasts 60 minutes or longer per year. Now that's an average number because some cost, and there's a few ways to look at it. Some customers may see more than that. Some customers may not just based off the area. So you've got to look at a couple indices on that. But we try to keep it under 60 minutes per customer. In, in your plan or, or that's, what that's is what our, That's what our today. reliability re reports have. What is the actual today? Um, 37, 
I think yeah, 37 I think. minutes. It, it fluctuates from year to year depending on your outages yeah. that you have. Um, we've been in under that 60 minutes for the, most the of the time. The point I'm trying to get to is, mm -hmm. is how long does the average customer experience no electrical service yep. in an annual basis compared to the possible up to $9 million cost for redundancy? That's, that's what I'm trying to get yep. at. You understand where yep. I'm going. Yeah, so like I said, we try to keep it under 60 minutes. I, I guess I'd have to look a little bit more into it to figure out what it would what we would go down to yeah. if we I remember the, everything the news done. article that was in the paper that had all three area right. metro area uh, utilities we were like at 26 and then I believe Cass County was about 26 minutes 26 minutes yeah. per customer per year and then uh, Cass County was I believe around that 50 minute mark and then Excel was about 72 minutes so you know to your point I mean we're under our standard we're quite a bit under everyone else. So on average, we're doing well. And I think what when we do the electric master plan, we will be looking at prioritizing mm -hmm. where we have the you know most critical areas, the ones with the most customers in them, you know, on them. So I mean, a radio feed with a lot of customers is probably gonna be a higher priority to get uh, looped or, you know, somehow backed up than a radio feed with one customer on or a few customers. So, I mean, we'll probably be looking at that, but at the same time, I mean, they might say, hey, you're pretty good. And the one that we experienced on the north side that was three hours long, now that that, that pole is repaired and the insulators are all repaired, I mean, that same thing isn't going to happen again right. for many, many years. So, well, uh, And correct me if I'm wrong, but there may be other ways within which we can provide service so that the, even without the redundancy that we can if we're going to have long-term problems, we can put generators in place or whatever. I think that's what Joe had mentioned previously, that there are some other things that we can do. But of course, a couple of ways of looking at that, and I understand your point, Les, on the measuring these outages in terms of time as to what, it's, what the value is. Obviously, if you have an outage in an area, there are other complicating factors other than just time. Time doesn't tell the whole story. If you've got uh, customers who are on uh, life support systems or whatever, you want to make sure that you, that time is kept to a minimum as well. Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, I, I guess the, the point I was trying to make is that uh, our loss of service is really low, even compared to our competitors nearby. We're still really, really low. And, I, and, and that's a point well somebody taken. Somebody out there saying, well, if that's all it is, why do you want to spend $9 million? I can hear the question yep. coming. And as you mentioned, Travis, we can do a number of things with putting stuff underground, right? That Correct. will resolve some of the special squirrel issues, my favorite topic. <laughs> We've yes. killed a lot of squirrels, Ralph. Yeah, correct. And, and the, the next actual report, we can, we can discuss that as well. So, I mean... To, to Ken's point there, you know, having generators and stuff like that, there is possibilities of that. However, that's not as efficient. Sometimes it actually is better just to have your redundancies. And like you said, we prioritize everything. Your feeders would probably be your first ones to complete, dependent upon other projects as well. I mean, have you, have you identified some glaring points where we have radials where we shouldn't have them? I mean, even right now, is it just did us all over and it's just a matter of either addressing them or not? Yeah, there are, and, and Joe and I have been talking about them even prior to you guys requesting this report. It's just a matter of how do we, how do we get that in the, into the budget and get it completed, especially with the, the year we're having. It's been a very, very busy year for construction for us. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Travis. I move to accept the report. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed the same sign, that motion carries. Are we going to move down to item F at the same time? Yep. And that really is to Ralph's question about, you know, overhead to underground conversion. And, you know, I'll just preface it. I know Travis has talked to a number of utilities. I've talked to a few utilities. It seems like there is a, a trend for municipal utilities to uh, underground their overhead system. And they do it, especially quite a ways south of us, they'll do it because of ice storms. And you know we do a substantial amount of tree trimming every year to make sure that we're ready for wind storms, ice storms. We don't have as much wind storms here, but uh, or ice storms, excuse me, but wind storms, wind storms we do. Um, 
but it is costly. And uh, again, we're looking for some direction um, on how we do this, if we do this, how to what extent we would underground. But like I say, some utilities have gone 100% underground. And then you really have a different uh, set of lineman skills necessary. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a strategic direction. Uh, and it would take a long period of time, so. Um, Where are most over under, or overhead lines? The older sections of town? The, well, really from the interstate, line. from interstate north. Yep. There's quite a bit of overhead from interstate north. Everything south of interstate is underground. Everything east of 20th Street is underground, uh, but but they're north. And, and new development will be underground. All new developments are underground. Yeah. Thank yep. you. That's the standard. So, so a rough estimate, how much do we have of the whole system do we have above ground? I'll, have let, have? Tra I'll let Travis kind of give his summary <laughs> now. And All right, so like, like we talked about, the overhead, the overhead conversion report is basically a supplement to the um, radio redundancy report that we just talked about. Uh, right now we have about um, 126 miles of overhead lines, and that's three-phase feeder lines, tap lines, and single-phase lines throughout, throughout the city of Moorhead. Um, basically that 126 miles is from Moorhead to Sox Center, Minnesota, um, and that's roughly about 25% of our, our distribution system is overhead. Um, you know, with that, we've got about 57 miles being feeders, 31 miles being three-phase taps, and then about 38 miles of, of single-phase lines. Um, you know, converting com to underground completely will reduce your nuisance outages that we, we discussed earlier, those being trees, squirrels, and other re weather-related type issues. Um, definitely gonna increase your reliability because now you'll have everything looped because when we do underground conversions, we make sure it's looped so that it's fed from both ways because it does take a lot longer to repair a underground fault than an, overground, an overhead fault. Um, definitely some different processes on, on how we're gonna handle this or how we're gonna figure it out. Um, some of the concerns that I've, I've had in talking to customers or products that we've done is that it's very hard to get easements in areas that don't have utility easements already existing. Um, and some of the, and a lot of the customers don't like those, those lovely green block boxes out in their front yards or, or in their backyards, wherever they would be placed. Uh, you know, talking with some of those other utilities, some of the things that they have talked about is, you know, paying to have those, the services of the customers put underground. Right now, we currently don't do that. It's a, a requirement of, their, of the customer to replace that overhead service and put it underground. We will pay for the wire, but they got to pay for the, the other costs. Um, and then, and I think that would deal a lot with taking care of the easement situation if we can, and, and that's what some of the other utilities have been talking about as well, is that if you take, if you get them, if you pay to pay, put the service underground, you can get the easement fairly easily. So, um, you know, looking at some of what the other customers did, um, they usually did a 10-year plan. However, they didn't have as, they don't have as big of a, a plant area as we do. Um, they roughly spent about $3 million a year over 10 years to, to uh, convert everything to underground. Um, Right now, with the way we're looking at it, it's going to take us about 20 years, 25 years, I think, is what I actually have in the report. And it's got a, and with including the services in those conversion costs, it's going to be about $77 million. Um, not including the services, you get down to about that $46 million. To get back to Les's point, there are some real economics here. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's obviously something we have to look at. And I, there's going to be some huge policy decisions if we go in that direction relative right. to whether or not we, we would bear the entire cost of going to underground in individual homes. I, that's problematic, yeah. uh, Les. And the other thing, uh, you work in cooperation with cities, so whatever their street work being done, you consider whether at that same time to do underground if, in fact, it's overhead at that point? I don't know if we would do that. Um, just because a lot of our utilities are in the boulevards, not in the in the center of the yeah. street. So um, for the water department, that's a, a great option. Um, okay. It would be something we would consider. Didn't but we I don't, do that on First Avenue North? Um, 
With their conversion, yes, we did put everything underground. However, a lot of it was in that boulevard area, not in the street area. Okay. So you, you had to keep a separation, or do we have to keep a separation by code as well with electric and the others? Uh, usually we just, they're usually we put it in a utility easement. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot easier to access in the boulevards if there was a fault that we would have to dig up and repair um, instead of having to dig up in the center of the street and dig up concrete and have potholes and stuff like that until they get repaired. In conjunction with this, the same reliability related question on going from overhead to underground, uh, where are we at in terms of having to replace aging uh, infrastructure uh, like underground wires are already in place because they have faults and right. the first generation wasn't nearly as reliable as what we have today. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, in 2012, we finished up all of our, our main feeder cable replacement um, that we were aware of that was in town or, or any of the old kit type cable that was in town. Um, that cable is supposed to be good for that 40 year number. Um, if it gets there, we'll see. Um, and then we're still doing on an annual basis about $200,000 worth of cable replacement for the, the one-aught lines or the, the distribution feeder lines. So the, the lines going from the, the main feeders out into the residential or commercial areas. Yeah. Is that enough? It's been a while since that, that uh, number's been raised. Um, we do what we can within the budget that we have, and we just try to, I guess, we make decisions based off faults and based off you know, age of cable if we can figure it out and, and make a decision on what needs to be done first and we just work with what we've got right now. That's a, you know, that's a good question and the same experience we're having on the water side where once we did an in-depth study and looked at you know, how much time it was gonna take us to replace that, we were seeing a train wreck come up you know, that we weren't gonna get done with the cast iron before we had a number of uh, water main breaks. On the electric side, you know, we're, we're doing like we did on the water side where we're spending the same amount of money, you know, even though we haven't adjusted it for inflation. So there's probably a need to increase that number, I would guess. Uh, Travis will be studying that more. Um, and that's just for the underground replacement. We haven't, and that's kind of like the cast iron versus the other pipe issue. Uh, you know, concrete asbestos, whatever, you know. Uh, here we've got the, the oldest underground looks to be pretty much replaced. The newer underground, which is, you know, up to, could be up to 25 years old now or whatever, will be kind of like the concrete asbestos. But then there's also the overhead line that you've got old wires and old poles. And I think when I talked to some of the utilities, they said they undergrounded things when they were going to replace the wires and the poles because that was the time you do it you know we're not going to replace new wires and poles you replace the oldest stuff and that's where the strategic direction comes in because right now we're just replacing old wires and poles with new wires and poles keeping it all overhead so now we have to ask ourselves what if any of the overhead do we convert to underground for protection from weather and squirrels and trees. So, mm -hmm. and I think what Travis has in his report is when we do our electric master plan, those questions will be asked and we'll put some more uh, time into analyzing it and bring it back to you for further discussion. Yeah. But I mean, and then the other, the other issue of course is the rate issue uh, because you know, if you're going to spend 46 or $77 million over the next 25 years, that's going to have a rate impact, and we have to wrestle with that as well. So we got to look at the reliability, and we don't want to rest on our laurels there because just like the water main issue, that can sneak up on you. So you have to have a good plan going forward on that, and uh, it's going to have a rate impact, and we need to make sure and balance those two. And Mr. Heller has already pointed out that we can expect rate increases. <laughs> yep, yep. But other utilities are having rate increases as well, you know, so they're, they're trying to catch up to our reliability and people are demanding more and more and better and better reliability as well. So we have to kind of balance all that. Well, the reality is we are a long-term business, right? I mean, we are right now taking advantage of stuff that was done 30 years ago by people sitting on this board or on this commission. And in 30 years, hopefully people will say, yep, they did, whoever it was did it right 30 years back. So mm -hmm. we, we got to look at that as well. So one question, Travis, so sure. if 
So we have 500 miles of cabling in Moorhead? Yep, that'd be correct. Holy cow. Yep. I thought Chris had a lot of water pipe. That's yep. only 200 miles. Yep. No, yeah, there is, a, yeah, the reports that we've got, we have about, if I'm correct, in that five to 600 range. That means if your stories are accurate, it would take your uncle about an hour and a half to drive the whole route. Uh, hour and 50 a day. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long story there. Yes, it is. Anything else for Travis? Can I have a motion, please? I move to accept item 8F. Is there a second? I second it. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign. Thank you, Travis. And I, one of the points, and Les made a very good point, we have really, truly reliable service in Moorhead, and uh, we should be proud of it. We've been proud of it for years, even dating back to when Tom Heller was a general manager. We did try to make even this place, so. even then, you know, that's many, many years ago before he had gray hair. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, that's always been our aim, and we try to provide the best service possible for the residents of Moorhead, and I think we're doing that to the best of our ability within the, the confines of the budget, as, as, as Les indicated. That brings us down to item 8G, and that's to accept the report on the aquifer management plan phase one. I'm assuming Chris is going to talk to this? Yes. Uh, Chris Knutson, Water Division Manager. Um, so it's obviously been a, a very uh, wet year thus far, but uh, for people in Southern California and Texas, really drought has been on the forefront of their minds uh, over the past few months with uh, an extended drought. Uh, and some very real economic concerns uh, in those areas of the country uh, related to drought. Uh, one of the things uh, the commission and uh, public service has done over the past 10 years is done some really good proactive planning uh, in terms of uh, the utilization of the Buffalo Aquifer, which is more public services, redundant source water uh, in case of a long-term uh, drought. And which we just used because of the oil spill, right? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point as well. Um, several, a month and a half ago, I believe, uh, there was a significant oil spill uh, in which we were solely dependent on the aquifer. Uh, in that case, the oil did not make it to the river, but there have been many instances uh, in which it did make it to the, uh, the river. So having that redundant uh, ability is uh, very beneficial for our residents and, and our, our utility. Um, but So that's, that's one of the other benefits as well. But um, in, in reference to a drought situation, um, we started in about 2009 uh, the process of developing an aquifer management plan. And as part of that plan, uh, the county atlas actually worked to develop some of the geological data um, between uh, 2009, 2010, and, and now. Um, and so really, phase one of this plan was started uh, long, long before I started in, in 2010. Uh, fortunately, that data has come together now um, and really is primed um, to help us as a utility start to develop some of the uh, drought contingencies that we'll need um, for, for a long-term drought. And really, phase one is the completion of that data set. Phase two will actually take that data set and, and we'll use that to evaluate what the buff Buffalo Aquifer could do for us in a 1930s drought, something that we've never uh, as a utility looked at, and certainly a very important question, how much water uh, can the aquifer provide in that 1930s drought scenario? So um, very recently we met with um, our consultant and the DNR. The DNR has been very involved in this project. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a unique approach to water resource management. Certainly they've had some uh, water resource issues over the past couple of years, so they're interested in this type of uh, management model. Um, and they've. They've been very involved and validated a lot of the approaches we've taken with this plan. Um, so phase one is, is really some of the data elements. Uh, we're hoping to complete phase two by the end of October. And uh, phase two will really set the stage for actually the writing of the water resource and aquifer management plan, uh, which we're hoping to start uh, at the, the latter part of this year. And something that I, I neglected to mention, we've, we've had several updates on the Red River Valley water supply project. Uh, which is kind of the other project that Moore is really looking at for uh, long-term drought scenario needs. Um, but we just wanted to provide an update on, on the progress on the aquifer management plan. And, and, uh, cool. Yeah. Bill, you had a comment? Yeah, from a strategic, strategic direction standpoint again, 
Um, and Chris just mentioned it, Red River Valley Water Supply, Buffalo Aquifer. And you know, Ralph is serving right now on the, on the um, Red River Valley, or the Lake Agassiz Water Authority, which is evaluating the Red River Water Supply Project. And uh, you know, is it going to be one or the other or both? And when you know Tom Heller had his pie chart up there, he had market purchases, he had nuclear, he had you know a, a number of resources. I mean, how many resources sources are we going to have? And then what do you want to pay for them? And that's going to be the big issue when we get to the Red River Valley Water Supply project. Is you know, okay, here's how much the Buffalo Aquifer can provide in a drought. You know, here's how much the Red River Valley Water Supply project is going to provide, and then here's what the cost is for each. And from a strategic direction standpoint, we're going down parallel paths. And at some point, Ralph's going to come back and say, okay, this project wants another, you know, $375,000 for a study. And then they're going to say, okay, now we want you to commit to a million dollars a year, you know, in, in some kind of a, a resource contract that we share with the city of Fargo and with others in. North Dakota and Minnesota. So right now we've got the luxury of having parallel paths and not having to make those decisions, but sometime you will have to make those decisions. You know, Ralph brought back to the commission a uh, $56,000 question and, uh, you know, and said, okay, you know, they want us to participate in this study. What do you guys think? We approved it. And our retired water division manager wants to have breakfast with uh, Ralph and I and, and Chris, you know, because uh, he wants to educate us on uh, his thoughts on which direction we should be going. So uh, just so you know, I mean, this water issues tend to uh, develop slowly over time, but uh, you know, and I'm not sure what the time frame is going to be, but you're going to be asked to make some decisions here coming up. Well, and there's some huge decisions that have to be made and we've been doing those dual tracks for at least as long as I've been on the board, uh, dating back to the 80s when we did in fact have a drought type situation with the red and it wasn't flowing. And a conversation that we had with Maury Lanning not too long ago when he made his presentation here. And uh, the Buffalo Aquifer is a tremendous resource that we not only want to cultivate and be able to use, but we also need to protect it, which is going to be a big issue with our farmer manager, like you said. But um, yeah, we've got some big issues coming. And, and quite frankly, the citizens of Moorhead apparently have a number of very big issues coming at them in terms of dollars and cents. We've got Mr. Heller who's continuing to build power plants. We've got the uh, uh, diversion uh, situation going on that the council was talking about yesterday. We've got a water supply issue that's huge to us. And, uh, and, yet, and we also have the maintenance issues that we have with the, both the underground on the water side and underground on the electric side and the overhead. I mean, we've got a number of big ticket items that we're looking at. And uh, we're going to be looking to you, Chris, and, uh, and probably to Cliff a bit uh, in terms of some direction that we need to take in order to make sure that Moorhead can rely on the water sources that we have. If not the red, the buffalo. And how long can we rely on the buffalo? We don't want to bring it back down to the levels it was brought down to a few years ago either. I mean, it's now recharged and it's full and all those kind of things, at least we think. So, uh, yeah, you, you talk about environmental concerns. Mm -hmm. Those are huge environmental concerns. Ralph? And on the, on, the, uh, on the water supply issue, I think that decision will come sooner than later. Uh, I think it has, some, it has some movement right now and, and we will be asked to be in a drone out. And that's going to be a big price tag and we have to make a decision at that point. That's why what you guys are doing right now on figuring out what we have in the Buffalo uh, is important as well. And again, we have the option too to go to Sabin and maybe throw another pump or two or three in, but that's not cheap uh, either. Uh, on the infrastructure, I mean, one thing, Chris, in, in your report, in that table, when it talks about you know when the wells were constructed, uh, some are almost as old as uh, Ken is here. Um, the question that I have- And in that, far better shape. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, i uh, sorry. <laughs> That's a good joke, right? but, uh, I mean, I, I, we're looking at some wells that were constructed in 1947, 1952, and I think we looked at some of the pumps when we were out there in the aquifer tour a yeah. couple of weeks ago uh, that probably are about that vintage. Uh, so my question, and I think Ken's question at that point was as well, uh, if the buffalo is, no, 
because the Buffalo is our backup right now, uh, is it reliable from a pumping perspective to rely on pumps that are about 100 years old, well, 60 years old, can they actually you know, give us the water that we need, and is there, is there the next project for us to look at in two, three, four, five years down the line? Yeah, yeah. you talk about priorities. You you are sitting right now with some rather hefty priorities on your plate. I appreciate that. Yeah, um, certainly. He's still looking pretty relaxed, though. He really is. We can, get some more stuff <laughs> we, we can get him over that. <laughs> uh, in the in the short term, we've we've actually done quite a few projects this summer to enhance the reliability. Uh, we don't have the full replacement of those wells in our capital improvement plan as of right now. Um, we're certainly uh, going to be incorporating that, I, I believe, in this budget cycle, uh, start to get some of those costs into our 10-year into our uh, CIP. Um, but even some of the projects we've done, uh, replacing some of the electrical components, um, we had a rather significant hole in the casing of one of the wells uh, that we'll actually be replacing uh, this, this week. Um, so some of those uh, small improvements, I, I believe, will buy us enough time uh, to the point where we can conduct that full replacement. You realize, of course, that if we get into a drought situation, time will not be on your side. Certainly, certainly. Uh, um, it's something we'll have to continue to evaluate on an ongoing basis. Okay. Any are, more comments? Well, the well system, too, is somewhat diversified. You know, you do have some newer wells on the north Correct. area. and. Time somewhat is on our side on a draw because it doesn't necessarily sneak up and attack you. It, it, you it know, you, you're going to see that coming. <laughs> you know, would so you, I mean, uh, Casey, make sure that that comment is in the minutes. <laughs> you know, and and uh, if it is a drought, you're likely going to have strong water sales, and but you probably will need to replace the pumps at some point and do that, you know, rather quickly. But quickly, as in, you know, you've got a couple of years because they're going to run, you know, but you're not going to feel safe with them. So anyway. And in terms of a time period to replace, I mean, it, probably looking at one to two years. I mean, we can do pump station projects fairly. But you were also fast. talking to us when we did the aquifer tour of not only replacing those pumps, but replacing the location of those Correct. pumps to Correct. ease the possibility of there being a hazardous waste site at that same location. Correct. So that, that too costs money. We'll, and that one would sneak up and on you. Absolutely, and and uh, well, Tom is sitting here. He'll remember when you could walk across the red, and uh, there was no water in it, and we were concerned about it. And Fargo wanted a, a supply of water from us. If we're talking about the whole thing that Rolf is working with, there are some big issues that have to be resolved in that regard as well. Huge issues in terms of okay, we've got this water supply coming from the, from Western North Dakota or wherever it's coming from. We've got treatment issues. We have. What do you do when the supply is limited? I mean, there's all sorts of things that we're going to have to grapple with. Mm -hmm. And uh, even the connection from the water would come down the Cheyenne, the connection from the Cheyenne into our plant is not a given because it would not come down the Red River route. It would come to the Fargo water plant. We would have to have a connection there. So this, this, these are big ticket items. And what kind of redesign would we have to do at the water plant in order to treat that water? Yeah. Yeah. There are some good questions there, I mean, that haven't been fully addressed. So the, as it stands right now, I, I don't believe any additional treatment would be needed for that Missouri River water uh, because they would have a biota plant. And the, the water quality of the Missouri is very good, uh, which was why it was looked at. But there, there may be unforeseen uh, issues that do need to be looked at in, in more detail. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments for Chris? Okay. Thank you, Chris. Yep. Could I have a motion, please, concerning this matter as well? I move to accept report 8G. Is there a second? second yes. Thank you, Corrine. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, the same sign. That motion carries. That brings us to the end of our agenda. I don't believe we're going into executive session, which we should do soon. Uh, but uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, please note some upcoming meetings. I believe that we have tentatively canceled the July 22nd meeting. And uh, this meeting is adjourned.